This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Fiscally responsible financial geniuses, monetary magicians. These are the things people say about drivers who switch their car insurance to Progressive and save hundreds. Visit Progressive.com to see if you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states or situations. Hey, true crime fans. Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. With Amazon Music, you have access to the largest catalog of ad-free top podcasts included with your Prime membership. After all, ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. To start listening, download the Amazon Music app for free or go to amazon.com slash ad-free true crime. That's amazon.com slash ad-free true crime to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. are listening to Wine and Crime, the podcast where two friends chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. Yes. I am Amanda. I'm Lucy. Oh, you are. It's so nice to see you. Every time, every time we record after like taking the weekend off, I just feel like I haven't seen you in a hundred years, even though we talk (laughs) every day. I know. Like the time a few weeks ago when we finished recording and it was like kind of a marathon recording and I think it was like a Friday or something. And we'd done ads and we'd had meetings. We were together virtually for like 10 hours straight. Yeah. And then as soon as we hung up, I remembered something I had to tell you and it had a visual component. So I had to FaceTime you and she answered the FaceTime like. Bitch, what do you want now? What could you possibly? <laughs> I remember the answer. I didn't even say anything. I just like. No, he just gave me a look. I just looked at you like, what is going on? That we both burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Listen, the codependency runs deep. <laughs> She's in there. She's Shh. thick. You got your hooks in me, sister. And vice versa. <laughs> My sweet girl. You know who else has their hooks in us? Our amazing producer, Andrea. Yes. Who is our very special fan picker for today. Staff picker. Staff pick. And she has an incredible podcast called United States of Lead. And this bitch <laughs> goes so deep. Shh. My favorite thing about Andrea, aside from her apparent work ethic, is just when she just pops up with the most niche conspiracy theories I've ever heard. (laughs) Unhinged facts, honestly. Like, talk about giving me new fears. I've known Andrea for a very long time. Girl, you're responsible for at least a handful of my fears. (laughs) <laughs> but you can check out United States of Lead on YouTube. They're also on TikTok at United States of Lead Pod. So check them out. I also follow them on like my Apple Podcast app. You could just listen in where you get your podcasts. But Andrea has selected the topic today of lead crimes. And obviously, <laughs> we are not going to be able to go as deep as she does, but like lead can be connected to so much Uh uh-huh it has to be like understudied as in terms of effects it's wild how far reaching lead the like lead exposure lead consumption Uh. Uh uh-huh oh god etc yeah (laughs) and we're gonna get to some of it but first in our wine crime pairing Mm -hmm. we had a recommendation from andrea and i want to give full disclosure my blood sugar has been waking hellscape nightmare for the last 24 hours, so I am not drinking today. I'm not even getting high. Oh, no. Because I don't want to give myself the munchies and derail all of the corrective progress that I've <laughs> made today. <laughs> so I hate, 
hate that I'm doing this completely sober, but I am for my I'm health. Not. I know you're not. I <laughs> knew I could count on you. But if you do want to drink along, the recommendation that Andrea made is a phenomenal Italian red. It's a multiple Chiano. And this is a very similar red to what ancient Romans would have drank, like this kind of dry red oh table wine. The version we're getting will not be full of lead, which we'll get to. But this particular bottle is Massiarelli Montepulciano di Abruzzo 2021. I'm proud. I'm proud of you for brushing up on your Italian. I can <laughs> d- 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 feign an accent when it comes to wine. I'm doing my best. Some nice things about this bottle is that it is a screw top. You do not need any tools other than your teeth, mouth, elbow, or hands to just crack that bad boy open. I wouldn't use your mouth. I wouldn't either. But like, you know. <laughs> Especially not while we're discussing lead. No. Just keep keep unnecessary things out of your mouth. No lead <laughs> present in this modern day old wine recreation. We can we can safely say we that. We don't know that. You can't say that. Contamination happens all the time. Oh, great. Okay. Well, <laughs> not as much hopefully present uh she's 13.5 percent abv this is gonna be like a really classic old world italian wine multiple Chiano is gonna give you rich dark cherry but not sweet because it's balanced with that sort of spicy like black pepper and almost smoky tones Mm -hmm. She's fleshy. She's full bodied. She has a lot of depth and like lingers really beautifully on the palate, finishes nice and dry. This is a bottle that you're going to want to get for your roasted meats, your like acidic red sauce pastas, your cheesy Mm. Alfredos, your funky cheeses, pizza. Uh, Corey's making manicotti tonight. This would be a perfect wine with that. Mm -hmm. Another great thing about it is you can get it at Total Wine and it retails between like 10 and 12 bucks. So this is a fabulous, classic, old school red that's going to be super food positive that you could bring to a party and only spend like 10 bucks on and be the queen of wine delivery. So 10 out of 10 do recommend when your blood sugars are stable enough to enjoy it, run, don't walk. But I wanted to expand a little bit more. I wanted to talk about lead, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the wine the Romans drank that was leady. Let's talk about lead. <laughs> I did literally write that in my notes. So <laughs> wine enthusiast, which is a... It's like a wine blog. It's a reputable website. Sommeliers mm-hmm. contribute to it. I really like it. It teaches you a whole lot about wine. They put out an article by Anna Archibald called The Disturbingly Long History of Lead Toxicity in Winemaking. So I thought this would be interesting to share in our wine segment today. Perfect. In recent years, wine has been touted as rich in antioxidants and healthy for your heart, which like, okay. These claims, though questionable, are in stark contrast to wines of yore that had a slightly more deadly kick. One common wine ingredient drove unwitting imbibers into a slow decline that sometimes even resulted in death. You guessed it, lead. The highly toxic element was, for millennia, included frequently in winemaking and storage. The metal was used as a sweetener. Those paint chips taste real good, y'all. Yeah, we'll get to this in my segment, too. Yep, a sweetener and preservative, as well as for its ability to impart brilliant clarity to glassware. So it was used in, like, every aspect. It's in your cup. It's in the drink that's in your cup. It helped make the drink that's in your cup. It's sweetening the drink that's in your cup. It's storing the drink that's in your cup. It's storing the drink that's in your cup. It's, It's rough. Its role in wine history dates to at least 2000 BC and even extends to today. In ancient Rome, the upper class favored wine sweetened with sapa, a syrup made by boiling down grape juice in leaded vessels. <sighs> when heated, toxins leached into the syrup, which was then combined with fermented juice to tame unpleasant tannins and bacteria, as well as act as a preservative. 
Quote, the role of manufacturing sugar lead goes all the way back to the Greeks, but the Romans popularized it, says Dr. Jerome Rigat... Mm, Rig, mm. <laughs> Jerome Riagu, Ph.D., uh, emeritus professor at the University of Michigan. He's also the author of Lead and Lead Poisoning in Antiquity. Quote, there are many records of essentially Roman doctors describing very precisely the symptoms of acute lead poisoning. One study speculates that Roman wine contained as much as 20 milligrams of lead per liter. Over time, the research Milligrams of Milligrams of lead. Of lead. Oh, Jesus. And it's important to make the distinction that, like, lead in its, like, raw, like, mineral form that you're not, like, eating is, for the most part, like, fine. It, we just can't be fucking consuming it. At, in, like, these high quantities. Like, it was used way beyond yeah, what it's it should have been used for. Yeah, it's a natural element. Exactly. Like, just existing in the world isn't going to give you lead poisoning, but mm -hmm. we use it in really high concentrations in a mm -hmm. lot of different things. And they had it has adverse effects. This says, over time, the researchers said it would cause a decrease in fertility and increase a psychosis among the Roman aristocracy. So basically, like, Obviously, all empires fall because empires are basically pyramid schemes and, like, buckle up, we're living in one. But, like, <laughs> insanity due to lead poisoning mm -hmm. soups didn't help the, th the, the, the longevity of the Roman Empire. Like, so much <laughs> has to do with the lead exposure and consumption of that time. Yeah, not even that it, like, was debilitating physically, health-wise, mm -hmm. in a lot of circumstances, but it... Might poisoned the mind yeah lead was also suspected to have been used in egyptian wine making vessel vessels the soft metal had the ability to be easily molded and shaped quote there are egyptian drawings of a large concave dish used to evaporate water out of grape juice says dr andrew waterhouse phd wine chemist and professor of enology at university of california davis this juice with a higher concentration of sugar was then fermented Quote, it was one of the few metals that Romans and Egyptians had that they could work with because it's malleable. He says iron was really much, much harder to work with. Unfortunately for them, the lead was toxic and they didn't know it. Thanks to its use in everything from plumbing and ceramics to cosmetics, pinpointing lead exposure as the cause of symptoms was tricky because it was fucking everywhere. Everywhere. It was it was so everywhere that it was like part of the culture. Like, yeah. Like. Oh, weird. They went completely Looney Tunes. That's just part. That's just what happens. Yeah. Next. It, it's your 30s. It's your 30s. <laughs> this classic. Am I right? Ancient Romans referred to paralysis and other physical and neurological problems that they experienced as colic pic pictonum. Greek physician Nicander suspected as early as 200 BC that lead might cause such symptoms in the population. So th people were on to it, but like it wasn't supported. In ancient mm -hmm. Rome, its toxicity was suspected to a degree, particularly in intentional poisonings. However, its use in wine and elsewhere persisted. Similarly, in medieval Europe, ingesting the metal was difficult to avoid. It was common in pewter drinking vessels, which leached toxins into wine and other beverages. Colic outbreaks like those experienced during the Roman Empire continued to plague Europe for centuries as lead sugars remained a popular way to sweeten wines and balance tannins. The connection between the disease and prevailing methods for correcting wines was drawn in 1696 by Eberhard Gockel, then the city physician of Ulm, reads a study abstract by Josef Eisinger, professor emeritus at the Department of Structural and Chemical Biology in New York. Anyway, <laughs> Gockel made this discovery after one such outbreak, which prompted Duke Ludwig Württemberg to ban the use of lead in wine under penalty of death. Ooh. Elsewhere, colic outbreaks continued, like in Devonshire in the early 1700s, caused by lead acetate sweetened cider. In 1767, Sir George Baker connected the outbreak to lead found in cider presses at the weights used to sweeten the cider. Yeah. In 2010... Uh -oh. <laughs> a discovery of champagne bottles from a 19th century shipwreck in the Baltic Sea revealed the presence of lead in those wines. A study of the find revealed high amounts of lead remained in the bottle's contents even after being lost at sea 
for 170 years. Holy shit. <laughs> so it sticks around, babes. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Last month, test results of glass fragments from the 8th and 9th centuries discovered at a dig site in Cordoba, Spain, were published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It found that the more recently produced fragments contained high amounts of lead, indicating that Spain may have been the first to produce lead glass, which oh, I know are good. like collector's items, like lead and uranium glass are, mm -hmm. you know, not super safe to drink out of, but maybe yeah. display them behind some kind of sealed container yeah around the mid-17th century the advent of crystal glassware by businessman george ravenscroft ensured lead's continued contact with wine quote ravenscroft experimented with the idea of adding lead oxide to the glass because it makes it so clear he had lived oh. in venice for a while which was a hub for state-of-the-art glass making in the 17th century mm -hmm. back in england he added a significant amount of lead oxide that makes the glass melt a bit easier but the big benefit was that it made it clearer crystal clear in fact mm. the discovery was monumental ravenscroft became the first to produce ultra clear glassware in england though he was far from the first to add lead to glass because it was easier to work with he could shape it into intricate designs Quote, that transparency became very attractive. It's an optics thing. What lead oxide does beyond make it easier to melt is that lead is high on the periodic table, so it has a high index of refraction. So it just looks so beautiful, it reflects the light. Ravenscroft referred to this leaded crystal as flint glass, as it was made from a base of calcine flint. He secured a seven-year patent for his process from King Charles II in 1674. However, his glass-making venture only lasted until 1679. He died in 1683. And I'd be willing to bet. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> it, this is like some fucking, what's that podcast that I love so much? With this the, podcast will kill you? No, with the, with the, with the mercury poisoning uh s town yes s town it mm -hmm. reminds me of s town but with totally. lead instead of mercury mm -hmm. anyway so like basically this discovery of how he made this glass led to like widespread manufacturing of this kind of glassware like into the 1980s like with l the lead oh, still boy. in it they phase out uh production and sale of like redell which is a really high quality wine glass maker mm -hmm. i am familiar yeah, we all have. <laughs> Face out the production and sale of leaded glassware in 2015. Oh, God. Though other wine glass manufacturers continue its use. Lead products are required to contain at least 24% or less lead, according to the UK regulation. Quote, it does raise the obvious question around safety. The general thought from public health officials now is that lead oxide that's in the lead crystal and some other glass product is chemically bound up. So it's not going to leach into the wine after short periods of time. But obviously, it's like we're still in the modern age discovering shit mm -hmm. like this. So mm -hmm. kind of makes me nervous. Funny that you mentioned uh, this podcast will kill you. As the hosts on this podcast will kill you point out, at the turn of the 20th century, the lead industry campaigned for the material's widespread use in everything from children's toys to paint and telephones. They aimed to drown out science that's pointed to lead's deadly effects. And it wasn't until 1978, around the time that Riddell began to manufacture its wine-enhancing crystal glassware, that the U.S. banned lead paint and pipes. Wait, who was who was advocating for use in lead for in everything? I mean, like the lead lobbyists. Yeah, basically everybody that was using it was like, oh, okay, it wasn't one particular like. No, but that that older the glassware guy who like made that type of crystal mm -hmm. famous, like it got so popular that everybody was using that technique. Mm, okay, and they really didn't want to stop, and like some places, I guess, still haven't stopped. They're just quote-unquote operating under the parameters set by like say in the u.s by the fda well like yeah and all the, the that all varies by country so if any does. given country doesn't have the, those standards then i mean i know i have vintage glassware that has fucking lead in it like i know that i do mm -hmm. i'm aware mm -hmm. anyway i am I, I've linked this article in my sources for time. I'm not going to keep reading it, but there is some other information about like what you can do. Um, there are like ways that you can shop lead free because like 
Lead was not only in the winemaking, but it was also really prevalent in these crystal clear decanters that were really popular. So, you know, if this is something that you care about and like you should, the lead content of the things that you use in your daily life should matter. There are things that you can do to like test it, to mitigate it. And, you know, you can look into companies that are not using lead in their production, but it'll be linked in our sources. Um, But yeah, even if you just look into lead toxicity in winemaking, that wine enthusiast article will pop up and it is really interesting. It goes on for a little longer, but yeah, it just the prevalence of it and how it was just straight up used like, oh, it makes, you know, this wine is super tannic and like really dry and kind of bitter. Here's this lead sweetener (laughs) that we can just add to it. Problem solved. Well, why think ahead? What are you drinking? I got a rum and coke and I got my new Stanley. (laughs) No lead in that. Probably not. Maybe. Well, there probably is. is, But it has the skinnier bottom so it fits in my cup holder. Nice. Well done. All right. Well. That was fascinating. Uh, We'll get to a lot of my part touches on things that you mentioned too. So yeah, we're going to expand on the lead. Well, let's take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors and then go dive deeper into the lead pool. Why don't we? What drives someone to commit the unthinkable? How does an ordinary person transform into a serial killer? If you've ever been curious about the twisted psychology behind the world's most infamous criminals, Mind of a Serial Killer is the podcast for you. From Jeffrey Dahmer to Ted Bundy to the Night Stalker, Mind of a Serial Killer takes you deep into the chilling minds of history's most terrifying murderers. As the layers are peeled back, Find out what compelled them to commit such horrific acts. I'm absolutely tuning into this. Mm -hmm. Follow Mind of a Serial Killer, a Crime House Studios original now. New episodes drop every Monday. Again, that's Mind of a Serial Killer. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. It's actually super funny because I mentioned Rocket Money to our dear friend Robbie the other day and his mind was blown he was like i don't know if i know anybody else who needs that more than i do because he's definitely somebody who had you know magazine subscriptions signing up for you know special tv channel like free access Always. until x amount of time seven to day watch trial that one show yes you're gonna yes. forget about it you're gonna forget about it and you know what most people in america think they spend about 62 dollars per month on subscriptions guess what you're super wrong <laughs> The real number is closer to $300 a month. That's not cool. No, it's a big difference. Even if just a couple of subscriptions fall off your radar, those recurring payments that you don't even know about can really add up. And they're not going to remind you about it. No, they're not. But you know who is? Rocket Money. Because they have that amazing dashboard that just lets you log in, take a look. They like map out your recurring payments. You can take a look at what subscriptions you've got. You don't have to lose money anymore because of stuff you forgot about. Because Rocket Money is going to remember it for you and go, hey, babe, want us to cancel that? (laughs) And you're going to go, yeah, with a tap. And then it's going to be gold. Yep. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. And just, like, be an adult. Mm Mm-hmm. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place on that beautiful dashboard, and you can also see exactly where your money is going. If it's, like, transportation or Mm -hmm. food and entertainment, which Mm -hmm. might that... Household bills. Mm Mm-hmm. Rent, mortgage, insurance, like it really gives you a nice, clear picture. And if you see any subscriptions that you don't want anymore, like Amanda said, Rocket Money can help you cancel them with just a few taps. Mm -hmm. Rocket Money's dashboard gives you a clear view of your expenses across all of your accounts. If you have multiple checking accounts, Mm -hmm. it's all in one spot. It's like easier than online banking i think it really is to just to just see where you're at anyway well my online banking app isn't going hey do you still want people magazine (laughs) yes i need my money nanny you can easily create a personalized budget with custom categories to help you keep your spending on track you can see your monthly spending trends in each category to know exactly what you're blowing all of your money on Mm -hmm. they'll also send you an email that's like 
here's how you spend money this week. You've spent like a couple hundred dollars more than last week. So like get get your stuff together. Yep. You also get alerts if bills increase in price, if there's unusual spending activity, or if you're close to going over your budget. Mm-hmm. And their new goals feature automatically saves money for you without you having to even think about it. Love that. So whether your goal is to just pay off your credit card debt, to put away money for a house, or just build your savings because that's what adults do, mm-hmm. Rocket Money makes it super easy and like you set it up once you don't ever have to think about it it's great Mm -hmm. rocket money will even try to negotiate lower bills for you sometimes by up to 20 percent. they automatically scan your bills and find opportunities to save then you can ask them to negotiate for you so they deal with customer service i love it that is my favorite part Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to 740 bucks a year when using all of the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash gals. That's rocketmoney.com slash gals. One more time, rocketmoney.com slash gals. All right, Lucy. Bring it on. What is our background? And I hope to God, psych <laughs> for lead crimes. Well, yeah, the lead and lead poisoning is so like insidious mm-hmm. and it happens on such a cellular level in the body that it is kind of the the health effects of it are kind of like wide ranging. So as far as specific psych related to lead poisoning, I don't have a whole lot of it, but mm-hmm. It, it's still, it, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I have a little bit of psych just about, like, in my case, how lead can fuck with your, like, cognitive capacity mm-hmm. so much that, I mean, it's a sense that, like, a madness can set in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, ki- we'll kind of get to it. Yeah. So There's it not a lot of, like, hard science yep. behind this, but there are a lot of theories, which we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Okay. Lead is a naturally occurring chemical element found in small amounts in the Earth's crust. So like we said, it just exists in Mm -hmm. nature. Its periodic table of elements symbol is PB. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. And has an atomic number of 82. Hot. At some point in time, I would have known what that even means. (laughs) But not today. That time has passed. (laughs) The Royal Society of Chemistry says lead has been mined by humans for over 6,000 years. Damn. So we know that the Greeks mined lead on a large scale from about the year 650, 650 onwards. I can't. (laughs) I can't with time. Mm -mm. It's exhausting. It's relentless. And the Greeks also knew how to uh, obtain the metal and convert it to white lead. Mm Mm-hmm. So lead is the basic metal element, while white lead, often called cerusite, cerusite, has undergone a, a, a chemistry. A chemistry occurs with vinegar and heat to transform it into, I think, like a powdered version mm-hmm. of lead that has different uses. Okay. So, for example, when this white lead is mixed with linseed oil, it has like great coverage so it's great for paint. Oh, okay. That's why we used, that's why like all paint had lead in it for so long. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So white lead specifically was the basis of paints for more than 2,000 years until the late 20th century when we realized how fucking toxic it is. Oops. And now we don't use it to paint like our nurseries anymore. Nope. Lead and asbestos. Mm-hmm. The good old days. Mm-hmm. According to Britannica, lead is believed by the alchemists to be the oldest of metals and mm. is highly durable and resistant to corrosion, as proven by the continuing use of lead water, pri- water pipes that mm. were initially installed by the ancient Romans. Yeah. I don't know if they're still in use, like people are still drinking from them. I think in the U.S., a lot of the pipes still exist but have been coated well, over 10 million homes in the U.S. still have lead pipes. Yeah, because, like, I think on a city level, they mitigated some of that. But, like, if they if your own older property still has it, the city's not going to come in and mm-hmm. do that shit for you. Like, that's going to be on you to get replaced or That's why coded. 
waterline insurance is a very good idea if you own a home. Mm -hmm. I think we had our waterline replaced with copper or something when we moved Mm in. Yeah, this house definitely had slash has probably quite a lot of lead materials in it. Well, anything that was built... Probably before like the 80s. Before the 80s would, yeah, would probably have it, which is Mm -hmm. like the majority of homes are not like brand fucking new. Yeah, and then we're looking back to Rome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, can't exactly tear up those streets and put in a new infrastructure. Like Easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Kind of protected for like, you know, history or whatever. Tourism. Mm. Lead is also mentioned quite often in early biblical accounts. There were all kinds of uses for lead, as you mentioned. For example, the Babylonians used it as plates on which to record inscriptions. So like a notebook. Oh, cool. The Romans used it for tablets, coins, and even cooking utensils, including as you said, winemaking vessels. Mm -hmm. Lead has been used in various products, including gasoline, paint, plumbing pipes, ceramics, solders, which I almost said soldiers. I think it's solders. You're right. Mm -hmm. Solders. They shouldn't pronounce it like that. (laughs) (laughs) You're right. They shouldn't. Solders. Soldier. Whatever. Batteries and even cosmetics. We'll get to it. (sighs) Because lead is soft, malleable, easy to work with, it melts with very low heat, and it lasts a long time. Mm -hmm. It has made it ideal for making everything from bullets and guns to pipes and fishing sinkers. In its pure form, lead atoms are relatively large and can pack tightly together, which makes the metal a good radiation shield since radiation particles can't pass through. So when you're getting your x-rays at the dentist Mm -hmm. and they put on that lead heavy vest vest. it's lead that makes sense Mm -hmm. although lead clearly has a lot of beneficial uses it can be toxic to humans and animals causing potentially intense health effects Mm -hmm. according to the world health organization young children are particularly vulnerable to the toxic effects of lead and can suffer profound and permanent adverse health impacts particularly on the development of the brain and the nervous system. Mm. And this is because kids absorb four to five times as much lead when it's ingested as adults do from any given source. Wow. Isn't that scary? Yeah. And I mean, it's just fascinating how like that the early development of our digestive system, obviously you're growing so rapidly in that like infancy into toddler prepubescent stage. You're just absorbing everything that you can get. I never thought about that, but like that makes perfect sense. It's the peak of your growth is in those like first 15 years of life. Yeah. It also reminded me of the botulism thing. Like you're not allowed to give kids honey or play in the dirt until Mm -hmm. they're over one Mm -hmm. because the, the botulism can get them. Yeah. And it, yeah, our adult digestive systems are like able to pretty much remedy that if we take it in in that Mm -hmm. small quantity but a little kid can't Mm -hmm. so interesting this is also because kids put their hands in their mouths and they stick shit in their mouths all the time yeah and then going back to those paint the the lead paint that comes off in little chunks they Mm -hmm. eat it and it tastes sweet so they keep eating it yep (laughs) oh god In adults, lead can also lead to long-term harm and can cause increased risk of high blood pressure, cardiovascular problems, and kidney damage. High levels of lead in pregnant women can also cause miscarriage, stillbirth, premature birth, and a low birth weight. Mm. Yeah, it can uh, contribute to infertility as well. It can contribute to literally Everything. everything. Sex drive. Yeah. Everything. So kind of to explain that without like actually explaining it and in terms of what the what lead does to the body on a molecular level i have a quote from howard who a physician epidemiologist at the university of southern california Mm -hmm. howard says quote lead has no useful purpose in the body but unfortunately it also mimics some of the other more essential elements Hmm. so the 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 chemical itself is it acts like an imposter It gets incorporated into various enzyme and molecular structures in the body and then just fucks with them. 
that wasn't his exact quote, but that's I what like he was that. Saying. Yeah. So it, it, it looks like, for example, calcium. So your blood cells mm. are like, mm, calcium. So and then it's like, psych, I'm lead, bitch. I'm going to give Surprise! you kidney disease. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck. So it leeches onto, as far as I can tell, like any part of your body. That's wild. Mm-hmm. People are usually exposed to lead through occupational and environmental sources. This mostly stems from the inhalation of lead particles generated through burning materials containing lead or the ingestion of lead contaminated dust, water, food, or hand to mouth behavior. So just mm-hmm. putting shit in your mouth. Yeah, babies. They like babies learn like their entire fucking environment through their mouth for like the first two fucking years of their life. Yeah. Nasty ass kids. <laughs> and then also, like, we get so many of our like spices, for example, from all different parts of the world. Mm-hmm. which may or may not have certain regulations, which may or may not are, uh, uh, be enforced. Mm-hmm. And so that can just contaminate the, the food chain, the yeah. food supply. Um, the World Health Organization's 2021 update titled Public Health Impact of Chemicals, Knowns and Unknowns, Ooh, estimate, mm-hmm, it estimates that of the 2 million lives lost to known chemical exposures in 2019, Nearly half of those were due to lead exposure. Holy shit. Half? Half. That's what they estimate. Because, again, it's so fucking hard to tell. Nail down. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's Mm -hmm. mind-blowing. And then you also have these potentially psychological impacts that we'll get to in this next segment, but, like, might contribute to depression and suicidal ideations. Donald Trump. Yeah, oh, definitely. But then you have these people potentially dying in ways that aren't just uh, blood disease. Yep. And then they don't get tested or whatever, but it's still, lead is still a contributing factor, Mm -hmm. possibly. Mm -hmm. So Andrea recommended that we look into the case of Beethoven. Oh, as in the Beethoven? Not the dog. The man who lived in like... The 1800s. Okay. So Ludwig von Beethoven's life was plagued by deafness, debilitating gastrointestinal troubles. Same. Girl, same. Yeah, tag yourself. <laughs> and also jaundice. Mm. Lots of other things. He was just really sickly, like, mm-hmm. for a lot of his life. According to a study published in the journal Clinical Chemistry, Beethoven was almost certainly exposed to lead, which may have contributed to his health issues. So he began losing his hearing in his mid-20s and was fully deaf by his mid-40s. And obviously, he's a very famous composer, extremely musically talented. So going deaf was not ideal. Nope. In a letter that he wrote to his brothers in 1802, which is now referred to as the Heiligenstadt Testament. Okay. He despaired over his declining health, his deafness, and even described some suicidal ideations, like I mentioned. In the letter, he asked that his health problems be described after his death so someone might someday figure out what the fuck was wrong with him. Because he's like, oh, wow. some, this isn't right. Yeah, I'm chronically fucking ill. Mm-hmm. We couldn't figure this out while I was alive. Maybe, it's getting worse. It yeah. has completely destroyed my life. Maybe studying me And sharing those studies will help other people. I think that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. So he never actually gave the letter to his brothers, but it was discovered in 1927 after Beethoven's death in his desk or something. Okay. Then just a year or two ago at the Mayo Clinic, they have a metals laboratory. Mm -hmm. So this laboratory was given the opportunity to grant Beethoven's wish of trying to figure out what the fuck was wrong with him. Oh, cool. A colleague of Paul Janetto, the director of the laboratory, asked if Paul would be willing to test Beethoven's hair for Mm -hmm. heavy metal. Mm -hmm. So they got like like two or three dozen strands of hair. And I think that they got him from like a private owner, someone who just had some of Beethoven's hair. My God. And could like prove it, uh, I would assume. So he said yes. And in the lab, the hair was like, it was like, it. they washed it, they treated it, 
before running it through the instrument that measures heavy metals. Mm -hmm. The results showed slightly elevated levels of arsenic and mercury, but the lead levels were somewhere between 64 and 95 times higher than they would be in the hair of a person living today. Yikes. That's a lot of lead. It's a lot of lead. Even for someone in his time period, that's still about 10 times higher than normal. Yikes. Mm -hmm. Though this amount of lead exposure would not have killed him by itself. Right. It definitely could have contributed to his poor health overall. I think that is super legit because we'll talk about it a little bit in my case, but like when you're already vulnerable or become vulnerable to other health problems, having this like underlying lead issue that's fucking, it fucks with everything like you've already said. Mm -hmm. And that includes your immune system. Mm -hmm. And so you're just like, it might not be the thing that kills you. Like maybe you die of pneumonia, like one of the people in my cases, but that pneumonia might not have killed you if you weren't also being slowly fucking lead poisoned throughout, let's just say, your entire life. Yep. By just living your life. Yeah. By drinking from that pewter goblet. Well, and like you mentioned, the adding lead to wine to Mm -hmm. make it sweeter. We know that Beethoven drank a lot of wine. And lead was often added to inexpensive wines because it binds the acid to make it taste sweeter, make it taste like a better wine than it is. It's just Mm -hmm. cheap wine. Well, and people so, often forget, too, that, you know, it it's not too long off history where in many parts of the world, wine and other like fermented beverages were safer and more accessible than clean drinking water. water. Mm-hmm. So like this is what people drank with their meals. They weren't having clean water. Mm-hmm. So it's not just like everybody was an alcoholic. It's like, well, no, but he drank more wine than the average. Well, sure. <clears throat> and all, yeah, I mean, that, it's just like such an interesting thing where it's like, yeah, of course they were fucking drinking a butt ton of wine and other fermented shit. They had no fucking clean water. Mm-hmm. That's why the Salem witch trials happened, too. Mm-hmm. So that is kind of the theory behind Beethoven's <laughs> illness, struggle, various chronic, illnesses. Chronically ill, girly. I want to get my lead tested. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're OK. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to tell. We'll never know. Yeah, there's no way to know. Write a letter to your sister. Don't mm-hmm. deliver it. Wait till you die. Yep. Check me for lead. Mm-hmm. Check me for lead. Got it. Okay, the next thing I want to tell you about is the lead crime hypothesis. Ooh. There's not a lot about this because it is just a theory. Mm-hmm. We can't prove it, but I think it's really interesting. And of course, Andrea is super into this hypothesis too. <laughs> mm-hmm. According to Discover Magazine, for decades, some people in the criminal justice, medical, and economic communities have believed that lead exposure contributes to juvenile delinquency and crime overall. Mm. The theory is referred to as the lead crime hypothesis. While studies correlate childhood lead exposure slash poisoning with later engagement in crime, experts can't and don't conclude that lead is the cause of crime because that's Mm -hmm. ridiculous but it is considered a possible contributing factor yeah well and especially if you know we see from crime stats that like underserved underfunded and over police communities have some of the highest crime rates these underserved communities might not have access to say lead mitigation like in their homes it's Mm -hmm. in cheaper food Mm-hmm. It's like there's so much crossover with like lead being present fucking everywhere that it's like mm-hmm. impossible to pinpoint it as the specific thing. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's like correlation, not causation. It's like this is also here and we need to be looking at it. Exactly. According to Forbes, the theory seemed to come about because starting in the 1960s, America saw a huge increase in levels of violent crime that peaked in the early 90s and then steadily declined. So mm-hmm. when they're comparing basically two graphs, mm-hmm. one is a violent crime and one is like uh, lead mitigation policies. Okay. 
So the theory is that violent crime rose as a result of lead poisoning because specifically because of leaded gasoline. Mm -hmm. I've seen this. This is America. Everyone has a car, Uh comes into contact with gas, fumes. You're ingesting Uh that. The lead content of gasoline rose steadily from the 1940s until about 1970 and then fell, reaching approximately zero by the end of the 80s. Mm -hmm. After that point, it's believed that crime declined because of lead abatement policies, like not using lead paint in homes anymore. Mm -hmm. So then if you're kind of looking at that delay, they explain that because of the kids are the ones that were impacted the most by the by the lead in the gasoline, for example. Yep. So then, then they, they had grow to grow up. up for 10 or 20 years and then they commit crimes mm-hmm. because it fucked them up when they were little. Interesting. Is that wild? That is wild. I mean, obviously, like we already said, there were like so many things going on in the world at that time as well. But I do not rule this out as a contributing factor. I mean, we discover things all the time about chemicals we've used mm-hmm. or, you know, all kinds of things we've ingested, consumed, p- worked with over the years that have had psychological and physiological effects on the human body and, and mind. So like, girls. Why, yeah. Why would this? This isn't that shocking. Like this shouldn't be discounted as part of the larger conversation. Yeah, I agree. And I don't know if it's like an issue of tracking, which could be which is reasonable to consider given how ubiquitous lead is yes like how are you going to track who came into contact with what lead thing Mm -hmm. yeah it's just it's everywhere so it's just sort of a fact of life i don't know that's sick Mm -hmm. well on a similar note i also want to tell you about flint michigan Mm. on april 25th 2014 over 10 years ago yeah The water crisis began in Flint, Michigan, when in a cost-saving move, the city switched its drinking water supply from Detroit's system to the Flint River. Mm -hmm. The inadequate water treatment and testing resulted in major water quality and health issues for Flint residents who were frequently, often, almost always ignored by government officials. Mm -hmm. Many complained about the foul-smelling, discolored, and off-tasting water entering Flint's homes for 18 months. Mm -hmm. This water was causing skin rashes, hair loss, and itchy skin. And those were just like the immediate effects. This is like, people always go nuts, as they should, because it's it's an unbelievable story and the movie is amazing, about fucking Aaron Brockovich. Mm hmm Like... Flint still doesn't have clean fucking water Mm -hmm. that their water is killing them. Yeah. And that's like one community. If you follow, follow little miss Flint on all of the social medias, because this is like her life's calling, but like this is one community that has been able to get some public attention, attention about this crisis. But like, this is not unique. Oh no. Mm -mm. To Flint, Michigan. So like, Take that shit seriously, because just because it's happening in that community where you may not live does not mean it's not fucking happening or bound to happen in your community. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, talking to the majority of our listeners, but if Trump wins and if this 2025 shit comes into effect and they dismantle Mm -hmm. things like the EPA. Yeah. There are going to there's. There's nothing holding these people accountable. I mean, yeah. And they've already there have already been significant impacts thanks to his appointees to the Supreme Mm -hmm. Court that have shredded all kinds of oversight and regulation. The Chevron shit. Yep. It's our I mean, obviously, we do not want Trump in office, but like it's happening now. So pay the fuck attention Mm -hmm. because we're not we're not safe from it. In the and current this, moment. This isn't just a day in the future. No. No, no, Getting no. a good, healthy dose of it right now, mm-hmm. but it will get a lot worse. Sure. If that happens. So studies later revealed that the contaminated water also contributed to the doubling or even tripling of elevated lead levels in the blood of the city's children. Oh, my God. So they were testing the kids tr- triple the lead levels. Yeah, that's sick. 
According to CNN, documents and emails show that Michigan officials may have altered sample data to lower Flint's water lead level reports. A fucking course. According to Professor Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and the city of Flint collected 71 lead level samples from homes when they were required to collect 100. Mm -hmm. So they've already fallen short by 29 whole samples. Mm Mm-hmm. The final report from the Department of Environment Quality only accounted for 69 samples. Oh, great. The two discarded samples were very high lead and would have lifted the so-called action level above the threshold where they need to do something about it. Yeah, those samples would have deemed this uh, an emergency, an immediate emergency crisis. So, of course, they're going to fucking get rid of that. So you don't have to pay Mm -hmm. to mitigate the issue. Yep. Capitalism is crazy. It's all greed and racism. We'll get to it. Yes. When that happens, the public must be alerted and additional action must be taken if lead concentrations exceed the action level in drinking water. The report stated that those two samples were discarded because they didn't meet the sample criteria. (laughs) They were too high. (laughs) Oh, they were just a little funky. We didn't trust them. We threw them out. Mm hmm. A June 2015 leaked internal memo from the EPA noted that several of Flint's sampling procedures were flawed and the data might be compromised. It also notes that the residents were instructed to pre-flush their taps before the samples were taken. Oh, trying to get rid of any buildup to reduce. It minimized the lead capture and underestimated the lead levels. They were not supposed to do that. Which is fucking stupid. It makes this so apparently intentional. Yeah. And also coordinated. I don't let my fucking tap run very long before I put my water. Like usually my water glass is under the tap. Yeah. And I'm I let it, it get off. a little cold. Yeah. But that's this like what I'm drinking. Just a couple seconds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There are many reasons for the Flint water crisis cover up, including inadequate testing and treatment, discrepancies in data and ignoring residents resident complaints so just like bad leadership bad Mm -hmm. government governance however the fact is that this is america flint is mostly black and about 40 percent of its population live under the poverty line Mm -hmm. so this leads many to believe that the dismissal of the public's concerns was intentional like i said and coordinated and that this is a direct result of systemic and institutional racism Mm -hmm. today the water crisis in flint is Getting better, and I say that very cautiously, Mm -hmm. but they did so much damage in terms of public trust and just the health of the community that it's going to be a really long time before things are all the way back to the way they used to be, if ever. Well, it's so sick. I mean, this is such a pattern, but it's like the community that is being harmed, that is literally sick because of their water. Is the, are the same people that have had to completely advocate for themselves to get access to clean water when they're like already in not just, you know, economically disadvantaged shape, but like they are physically Im- and psychologically impaired because of the water that their city is fucking feeding them. Mm-hmm. And then they're the ones who have to take up arms to advocate for their clean water. Like nobody was coming to help them. No. And in fact... People were actively trying to silence them so that they didn't have to fucking sink the money into this community to fix this problem. Yeah. It's just so fucking sad. It's so sad. And then also you think about how the kids absorb it at such higher rates than adults. And Mm -hmm. then the kids are going to grow up and they're going to they're going to be fucked up for this whole generation, Mm -hmm. you know, potentially. Yeah. I mean, we won't know the Mm -hmm. full picture of what the effects of this crisis are for a number of years now yeah i hate it (laughs) it's really rough it's really just change this podcast to i hate it (laughs) god welcome to god with lucy and amanda (laughs) heavy sigh gestures vaguely (laughs) god So Flint has met the standards for lead levels for eight years in a row now, and it is replacing old infrastructures with updated slash non-lead materials. Mm -hmm. However, many are still suffering. 
The lack of affordable housing in Flint has driven many to public housing where the lead levels are frequently found to be much higher. Mm -hmm. Because, again, there is still a lot of discrimination happening Mm -hmm. here. Well, and resource hoarding. So they're just not Mm -hmm. investing Mm -hmm. in these services for people. Mm -hmm. So, like, of course, these shelters and, you know, affordable housing are going to be the last on the fucking list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So getting better, but I'm not great. It's not great. And I and I still don't feel all that optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. They did the damage that they did is, I mean, criminal to say the least. Uh, anyway, okay, I have a few interesting facts for us about lead before I tell you my last story. Okay. As I mentioned, an estimated 10 million U.S. homes are still connected to water mains with lead pipes. So if you live in an older house, mm-hmm. you might want to get that checked out. Maybe. Yeah. Or Doesn't just hurt. ignorance might be bliss if you, <laughs> if your bank account looks like mine right now. Girl. <laughs> Yeah, might be one can you could kick down the road for another year or so. I feel that. <laughs> lead is so similar to calcium that human cells latch onto lead instead of calcium, as I mentioned. It's just the way that it gets into your body. Mm-hmm. And also, because the lead doesn't like degrade very quickly at all, mm-hmm. there is no chemical difference between pure lead and like recycled secondary lead. Mm. And ancient alchemists believed that lead could be turned into gold. I don't think they got there. Mm -mm. They believed everything could be turned into gold. Honestly, that was the goal. Go for the gold, baby. Yeah. I don't. Alchemy's weird to me. So weird. It's like weirdly, it's like chemistry, but it's also like magic. And it's it's also like science. Yeah. I don't know. It's weird. I like it. Yeah. I like the vibe of it. Love the vibe. But also, wouldn't you get frustrated after hundreds of years not yes. ever really turning anything into gold? Because I, I don't think that's actually possible. I mean, I think that's why, like, anytime you see, like, a grizzled alchemist presented in the media, like, they are not well. They're just chilling with these chemicals in some fucking cave under a tree stump trying to make gold <laughs> for a hundred fucking years. Their hair's all falling out. They got fucked up teeth. Yeah. Obviously, Again, lead poisoning. Love very the frustrated, vibe, but <laughs> that shit's weird. Yeah, there's no such thing as a not frustrated alchemist. I don't think so. I don't like prove, pro- show me in history and a not frustrated alchemist because they were not ha- getting the results they had hoped for. No, not and a this one. went on for thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, like it's like the it's like one of the ancient sciences. Yeah. Hmm. Did it ever work? Girl, I don't fucking know. Alchemy crimes. That'll be a very short episode. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. We should definitely do it. Love a short episode. Um, uh, Okay, so the last one I want to tell you about is the story of Maria Coventry, Countess of Coventry. Ooh, okay. Uh, Well, maybe Maria Gunning. Nah, Maria Coventry. I don't know. Maria. Maria (laughs) Gunning was born in 1733 I didn't do geography. What's wrong with me? That's These okay. names are ridiculous some. enough. Mm-hmm. She was born at Hemingford Gray near St. Ives, Huntingdonshire. She was the eldest of four daughters of John Gunning of Castlecoot, <clears throat> County Roscommon, and her mother, Bridget Gunning, nay Burke, mm-hmm. daughter of the sixth Viscount Burke of Mayo. Maria and... <laughs> This is so fucked up. So there are four daughters, right? Maria Mm -hmm. and two of her sisters were known around London for their beauty as the three graces. Specifically, Maria and her sister Elizabeth were considered the most beautiful women of their generation. Okay. So first of all, there are four sisters and only three graces. The one with a great personality. Yeah. And then only two of them are the most beautiful of their generation. Listen. If you're not going to pick one, <laughs> then don't fuck just off. insult them one by one as you go down the list to the final two. That just seems so rude. It's brutal. It's, it's fucking brutal. brutal. The 
I don't even know what the four sisters' name is. The impossible (laughs) beauty standards of 1733 (laughs) fucking coming out in full force. We're still we're still living in it. Yeah, we're still living under the the iron fist of the three graces. (laughs) We'll get to their iron fists. Oh no, (laughs) they're laden. They're laden fists. I just I was just reading this like it feels the family and the sisters and like. This is really rude. <laughs> and it's that's what it is in like Wikipedia. That's how history remembers these girls. These four sis- sisters. Two were like the most gorgeous. <laughs> One was fine. And the other was We don't even gross. know her name. Gross. We don't even fucking know her name. Yuck. Yuck. Fucking yuck. <laughs> Ish. Ew, it's not good. No, it's mean. <laughs> poor fourth sister. Poor we nameless are fourth writing sister. history. The four graces, all beautiful in their own way, with no hierarchy or comparison. No. <laughs> Herstory. Herstory. So anyway, Maria was hot, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> From 1741, they were brought up in Ireland. And the Gunnings split their time between Roscommon and Dublin. I think their dad was from Dublin, mm-hmm. and they lived uh, they lived kind of back and forth. Okay. So the teenagers quickly made an impression in Dublin, despite their airs. It's they were kind of like mm, we're so hot. Everyone thinks we're so hot. Mm. But the family was not wealthy. Okay. So their mother. <laughs> guilted the two prettiest sisters, so Maria and Elizabeth, Mm -hmm. into taking up acting in order to earn money for the family. Oh, my God. She was a stage mom. She was a total stage mom. (laughs) This is some Mama June bullshit. Mm -hmm. You get on that stage and work, and I will be taking the money and buying myself a new fucking house, and you're never going to see a goddamn dime of it. You are... More spot on than you think. Oh, no. Also, at this time, Maria's 15, and I think her other sister is, well, she's younger than her. So there are, like, like children. Yeah. In October of 1748, a ball was held at Dublin Castle, and the two girls, the two pretty ones, Mm -hmm. really wanted to go, but they didn't have anything suitable to wear. Mm. So their stage manager slash fairy godmother... Thomas Sheridan supplied them with two costumes from his green room. Oh. Or his dressing room. Green room? Always a good payoff to know a theater nerd. Uh, Picture this. So they're like, oh, we want to go to the ball at Dublin Castle, but we have nothing to wear. And he's like, allow me. And, you know, he was like a gay stage you, manager. He must be. It's I, it's giving Stanley Tucci in The Devil yes. Wears Prada, that scene. Yes. <laughs> So he goes in his prop closet and he pulls pops out, out of a garment rack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With two gowns. One was the costume for Lady Macbeth and the oh. other was the costume for Juliet. Shut up. <laughs> I know. I have goosebumps. This is my dream. <laughs> I, I just want to stay. I, I'm watching Ever After tonight. Yeah, that's it. That's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Let's fucking wrap this shit up. All of the things from my teen years are culminating into like one perfect memory and ever after is the remedy yes. for what I never got to have myself. Mm-hmm. At least you didn't have two other sisters. No. <laughs> Just one. One arguably one hottest grace. one. One grace. <laughs> and then I was the one with a great personality. <laughs> <laughs> You do have a great personality, but you I also do. have a fine ass. Thank so, you. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you. Okay. So they're in their ridiculous costumes, which Incredible. may have fit in just fine at the time, but yeah, I think they- 1700s. I, th- I think they like, ca- they caused a bit of a stir. I, they mm. like made an impression. So at the ball, the girls met the Earl of Harrington. Ooh. And uh, apparently he- really liked them. He was very taken with them because in 1750, and I think the mom, Mrs. Gunning, was like kind of conniving. Mm. Like she was totally a stage mom. Like she was trying to get her bag. Yeah, through her kids. 
through her kids. So they, I think they must come home from the ball and they were like, we met Earl of Harrington and he really liked us. So then she kind of cozied up to him. And two years later in 1750, Earl of Harrington granted Mrs. Gunning a pension of 150 pounds, which is the equivalent today of over $55,000. Jesus. So he just gave her like a bunch of money. Yeah. And they used this money to move back to London. Okay, so he's like, I want your hot daughters close by for when they become of childbearing age. She basically sold well, her kids. He's in he's in Dublin. He's in Ireland. Oh, they okay. move back to London. Okay. I don't know his motivations for he's giving like, her the money. Get these hot underage girls away from me or I'm going to be <laughs> bad. Here's 150 bucks. Please go. Maybe, maybe that was his motivation. Maybe he wanted to Sleep with Mrs. Gunning. Maybe he did. I don't know. But either way, they go back to London and their beauty of the two. (laughs) I I won't get over that. I will. The hierarchy. Their beauty once again took London by storm and won them acclaim. Mm. They were like the Paris and Nikki Hilton of London. (laughs) Just picture that because everyone knew everyone knew who they were. This is actually fucking perfect. I love this. They were like club girls. In in December of 1750, they were presented at the court of St. James, and they made the newspapers. Ooh. So they were like tabloid fodder. They really yeah. were. And apparently- They're socialites. They're socialites. Apparently, Maria met, would have been like King George, whoever the king was at that time, but he was like 100 years old. Ew. She met him at this party. Mm-hmm. And- she said something to him like, oh, how I wish I could see a royal funeral. <laughs> okay, But girl, he's like yes. almost dead himself. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> so, she knows what the fuck she's doing. <laughs> so, Please invite me. Put me on the list. Yeah. I'm so, so sorry you died. Have you seen that Nathan for you? No. <laughs> Do you know what Nathan for you? Yes. I love Nathan Fielder. <laughs> he invents <laughs> like a... Computer generated animation of pets saying goodbye to their loved ones like no. after they've been put down. No. <laughs> so but it's really poorly done. <laughs> and and the voice actor that he chose has like a a thick accent. Mm-hmm. And so when the dog is talking and the little boy is like watching the video with his dad. Oh no. It's like their beta testing program. <laughs> The dog goes, it's me, Maddie. So sorry I died. (laughs) I am in heaven now, and I'm very happy here, so I won't be coming home. (laughs) And the little boy looks at his dad, and he goes, that's not what Maddie sounds like. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) I'll send you the clip. It's so Please. So, yeah. So sorry I died. But, yeah, she's like, I really want to go to a royal wedding. And he's like, well, I'll give funeral. it like 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. Funeral. Yeah. So in March 1752, so two years later, Maria married George William, the sixth Earl of Coventry, making her the Countess of Coventry. Shit. Her final form. Mm-hmm. They had one son and four daughters, probably all hideous. Yeah. <laughs> Four graces. Four graces. Maria's popularity in England reached almost superstar status. And at one point, the king had to provide her with a guard after she was mobbed in Hyde Park while taking a walk. Wow. Chapel Roan could never. No, the boundary setting. We Mm -hmm. respect it. But like your joke about it being kind of like Paris and Nikki Hilton, that tracks. Like Mm -hmm. those bitches can't go anywhere. Mm hmm. They are so famous. Ugh, nightmare. Yep. Nightmare. Unfortunately, Maria's health was not the greatest Uh-oh. because of her vanity. Oh, I forgot. Lead. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Lead. I know we were having so much fun. <laughs> At the time, especially among the ladies of the court, having very, very white skin was highly fashionable. Mm. So it's like pale white skin with red cheeks. That's what yep. they wanted to look like. I can so clearly picture that makeup style. It's like so iconic Mm -hmm. in art and and honestly, all over all kinds of media. Like fucking Marie Antoinette shit. It was kind of like, I mean, I'm sure I'm not using this term correctly, but like Mm avant-garde. Like it was 
like really, really white and really, really red. Yeah. It was like, uh, it was, I don't know. It was, well, it, was, was in, it was intense. And it was such like an elite, like these were not commoners in this mm-hmm. style of makeup. Yeah. Ladies of the court. Yeah. So this look was made popular in part by Madame Pompadour, who was mm-hmm. a mistress to King Louis the Fifteenth. Okay. So they were like, ooh, that sassy bitch, that court lady. We want to look like her. Yeah, let's go. She's radical. This white makeup called Venetian Ceruse was full of lead. Oh, no. So because it was full of lead, it was really, really irritating to the skin. You don't say. It would cause eye inflammation, skin eruptions. So like Eruptions. zits, Zits and blemishes and bumps and stuff. And it would erode your tooth enamel. Oh, no. So because of how fucked up, how much it would fuck up your skin, they just put more and more makeup over it to cover it up. cover it. They just layered it. Snake eating its own goddamn tail. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) Maria died of consumption on October 1st, 1760 in Krum, Worcestershire, at the age of 27. Mm. Isn't that sad? Uh, That's so sad. That's so young. And also, like... She had five fucking kids at 27. I was just going to (laughs) say, how wild... I mean, honestly, people were living to, what, 60 if they were fucking lucky around this time? But it's like... So much life was lived in those early years... Yeah. Uh, well, she went to a ball at Dublin Castle at 15, for 15. God's sakes. Who it can say that? It changed the trajectory of her whole life. Yeah. Thanks Flirted to Stanley with the Tucci Earl. loaning her that Lady Macbeth dress. Seriously? <laughs> it's such a weird story. It literally reminds me in Ever After when, who is it? Fucking Drew Barrymore? Not Drew Barrymore, but who's the inventor guy that she's Michelangelo. Alleged, Michelangelo makes her the wings for the ball. <laughs> it's like, it's that. Just breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I have to watch this movie. The Those glitter. Be like, why? And I'm gonna be like, why Fuck not? Off. Yeah. Leave the house. <laughs> Here, I made you a drink in this antique cup. <laughs> Just go have some coffee out of your pewter goblet, <laughs> and we'll talk about this later. <laughs> Sniff this pencil. Leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll just watch it You've on my been bathtub TV. Banish. Yeah, there's a lock on that door. You're fine. There sure is. <laughs> so, according to the National Gallery of Ireland, ten thousand people went to go see her coffin, and she became known in society circles as a victim of cosmetics. Oh well, I hope that ghosts are real so that she had an opportunity to watch the royal funeral she always wanted to see yeah no shit and it was just just happened to be her own well now she's a ghost so she's as white as she (laughs) my god she has her ideal pallor that's fuck like Mm -hmm. you caked on so much fucking lead makeup you got consumption and Die. <laughs> yeah, but probably also not before like your tooth, your teeth fell out. Oh, and I bet she looked rough in the end. Your hair falls out. Ugh. Ugh. I what mean, every. The, what was the poisoning that like the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz got from his makeup? Was it lead poisoning? Was it lead? I'm looking it up right now. Tin Man poisoning. It was poisoned by the aluminum dust makeup used to create his silvery appearance. Yeah. Oh, my God. He was put in an iron lung. Yeah. It was not a great situation for the poor Uh, buddy. I mean, the makeup looked fantastic. Truly iconic. Truly iconic. mm -hmm. But we're so sorry. So sorry. We didn't know. No. Anyway. Wow. That was a lot. (laughs) We covered a lot of ground there. Yeah. We really did. I'm so glad you gave us so many little snippets. I'm going to focus on one specific moment in history. So I'm glad you gave us a little bit more that we could chew on, more lead yeah. chips to chew on. Yeah, chew them up, crunch right. them down. Well, let's take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors and then dive back in. Love it. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Fiscally responsible financial geniuses, monetary magicians, 
These are the things people say about drivers who switch their car insurance to Progressive and save hundreds. Visit Progressive.com to see if you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states or situations. أعلي الحماس مع منيو بيتزا هات ماي بوكس الجديد أربع خيارات ماي بوكس تعدلها على كيفك وزيد عليها اختيارات ما لها حدود أطلب ماي بوكس اليوم وخليها على ذوقك بيتزا أو ملت كله بكيفك وطلباتك الجانبية اختر اثنين أو مشروب خياراتك ما تنتهي هي شروطك وحكامك اللي ترضي ذوقك منيو بيتزا هات ماي بوكس الجديد بشروطك وحكامك بيتزا هات أطلب اليوم I am not a breakfast person. I'm not that much mm. a morning person. I'm definitely not a morning eater person. Me either. But like, it's really hard to wake up these days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, when coffee's just not that appealing to me, it gives me the jitters so bad. And uh, I have recently been exposed to mud water. Mm-hmm. That is a coffee alternative that It, it it checks all the boxes for me. I don't mm-hmm. get like a crazy upset tummy. I don't get the jitters. I don't have like a a crash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mud water is a coffee alternative filled with chai, cacao, lion's mane, chaga, reishi, cordyceps, turmeric, and cinnamon. Mm-hmm. All this stuff that's just like classically, historically good for your body, mm-hmm. and it tastes delicious. It smells so good. It gives me that same like morning wake up energy that d- but without like making my heart go insane yeah so mud water is like coffee's like chill like vegetarian yoga loving cousin <laughs> who like went on a spiritual retreat and came back a different person mm-hmm. imagine being alert and calm at the same time while also not having trouble sleeping at night because that's my other fear if i mm-hmm. have something with caffeine and like coffee way later in the day Am I yes. going to be able to go to sleep? This has hit me so hard as I get older. I cannot have coffee after like 2 p.m. anymore. Yeah. Can't do it. I'm a sensitive I'm a sensitive body, you know? You're a cancer. I'm a cancer. Not only does mud water give you that morning boost you need, but it's also packed with adaptogens, antioxidants, and all those other fancy health words that just make you feel superior to your coffee drinking friends. Mm-hmm. Give mud water a shot and save big because our listeners get up to 43% off your entire order, free shipping, and a free rechargeable frother. Yes, a, I love the frother. The frother somehow makes it taste even better. It does. Yeah, so use our exclusive link. Head to mudwater.com. That's M-U-D-W-T-R.com forward slash gals. I like to mix mine with almond milk and use Yum. my little frother. Oh, my gosh. Sometimes I'll steam the almond milk first. And then mix it in so you can have it iced or hot. I'm obsessed. It's so tasty. Every single ingredient in Mudwater's products are also 100% USDA certified organic. They're non-GMO. They're gluten-free. They're vegan. They're kosher. For me, as a diabetic, this is my favorite part. There's also zero sugar and no sweeteners added. So if I want this in the morning to get my day started, I'm not chasing high blood sugar spikes by consuming this. It's a miracle. Each ingredient in mud water also serves a purpose. With organic ingredients for a clean, natural boost, mud water's smooth, earthy flavors provide a delicious and natural source of energy. Their OG blend contains cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and a hot chocolate-like flavor. That's my go-to. That's my fave. Lion's Mane is in there for focus, cordyceps to promote natural energy, and both chaga and reishi to support a healthy immune system. So yeah, we were talking about that 3 p.m. cup of coffee. You get that lull in the middle of the day and you're like, oh, I got to reach for another cup of coffee. But then you're awake all night thinking about all of the bad choices you made to lead you to that moment at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah, let's not do that anymore. Switching to mud water can help you say goodbye to sleepless nights. It's got all the energy without the late night existential crises. To use mud water, you simply drop the powder into your favorite mug or your favorite glass. You can pour some water on it or use some of your favorite like milks or milk alternatives. Some will even just jazz it up. You'll add a little creamer. You'll add a little honey. You can add CBD oil. Like there's so many ways that you can make it uniquely yours. There's also caffeine free blends available if you want all those other benefits. But you're one of those hashtag blessed people who doesn't need the extra energy. I don't know how you live, but I'm jealous. 
The best part about mud water is it provides sustained energy without the spikes and the crash of traditional coffee. We are obsessed. For a limited time, our listeners get up to 43% off your entire order, free shipping, and a free rechargeable frother when you use our exclusive link. Head to mudwater.com slash gals and grab your starter kit. That's up to 43% off your order at mudwtr.com forward slash G-A-L-S. After you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Stay energized and refreshed all season long with mud water because life's too short for anything less than natural, delicious energy. Are you ready for my case? Oh, yeah. I know you are. So much that I put in here, I wasn't going to really deal with. And then I was like, but no, Lucy's going to love this. So I already know what case you're doing. And this is one of my favorite, like, episodes in history. It's wild. So to get into the mood for today's case, we need to go back to a stinkier disease riddled era the 1800s because today wool socks yep we're talking about the tragic and mysterious story of franklin's lost expedition yes so franklin's lost expedition is one of the most famous and tragic tales of arctic exploration in 1845 sir john franklin led two ships the hms erebus and the hms terror yeah (laughs) i don't know why they named it that girl well i I tried to find out (laughs) i failed (laughs) on a mission to find the northwest passage a coveted sea route that would connect the atlantic and pacific oceans we were like so obsessed with expanding trade especially from like europe to North America. Mm-hmm. And so this was explored as like a more direct path, but like, my wanted, God. Weren't they looking for the Northern Passage that was that would be like a shortcut, like over the top of the globe? Correct. Instead of all the way across the Atlantic? Precisely. Precisely. Franklin had a storied career in Arctic exploration and was highly regarded, having first traveled to the region in 1818 as a second in command of an expedition towards the North Pole of the ships Dorothea and Trent. Franklin was subsequently leader of two overland expeditions to and along the Canadian Arctic coast. So he didn't just explore by ship. He also like traversed areas of the Arctic. Um, He did this in 1819 and 1820 through 1822. And then another mission in 1825 to 1827. So they were like, Dope. This is our guy. Bitch knows the Arctic. Lock him (laughs) in. The expedition aimed to traverse the last unnavigated sections of the Northwest Passage in the Canadian Arctic and to record magnetic data to help determine whether a better understanding could aid navigation. Oh, because they're compasses. Correct. Mm. This was and remains a dangerous region to travel through. The ships were equipped with the latest technology of the day, which included steam engines, so they didn't have to be, like, humanly rowed, basically. What? These were also These ships were also huge, but, like, steam engines were fairly new technology. Oh, I get, okay. <laughs> I heard humanly rowed, and that didn't... So they didn't have to be. R- yeah. Row. Yeah. Got row. it. Yeah. Okay. Reinforced bows constructed of heavy beams and iron plates... And they also had, which like no ships had before, an internal steam heating system for the comfort of the crew in polar conditions. Ooh, central air. Kind of. The ship was also outfitted with a system of iron wells that allowed the screw propellers and iron rudders to be withdrawn into the hull to protect them from damage because they're going through like ice fields. That's so high some- tech. Yeah, so sometimes they would have to like kind of pull in some of the some of the equipment because the ice was so thick that any kind of like yeah collision. It's like how we have the we can do that with our fucking side mirrors now on new cars. Like tuck those bad boys. Yeah. So the ships also carried libraries of more than a thousand books and a three year supply of food, which included tinned soup and vegetables, salt cured meat. Pemmican, which was a mixture of tallow, dried meat, and sometimes dried berries. This is a calorie-rich food. It can be used as a key component in prepared meals or eaten raw. Historically, it was an important part of indigenous cuisine in certain parts of North America, and it is still prepared today. So I thought that was cool. So it's just like no attention is paid to how it 
looks or tastes. It's just energy. It kind of looks like if you I've seen I saw a picture of it. It kind of looks like a meatball. And like I would compare it to people will make like power snacks out of like oatmeal. And oh, yeah. So it's like that. But it was like those birds. It was animal balls. fat, <laughs> animal fat, cured salted meat. And then they'd like throw in some dried berries if they fucking had it. And like I think it was held together in kind of like a doughy. OK. Base. They also had several live cattle on. So these ships were fucking huge. Like this wasn't a little schooner. They were big boys, and they were originally built as warships designed to withstand literal explosions, so they were expected to survive the harsh conditions of the polar environment. Temperatures outside could drop as low as negative 48 Celsius overnight and negative 35 Celsius during the day, so fucking cold. What's that in Fahrenheit? That's a good question. I'll check. Negative 35 Celsius is negative 31 Fahrenheit. Yeah, I feel like when it gets down that low, they they start to become more similar. Mm -hmm. So negative mm -hmm. 48 Celsius is probably about the same in Fahrenheit. Negative anyway. 48. Uh, yeah, it's a negative 54. There you go. Yikes. Conditions on board the ship were not necessarily much warmer, but they did have that steam heating system. Previous expeditions reported that were not on these fancy high tech ships reported the officers sitting around in their great coats below decks in freezing temperatures. That's just like how they existed. But Franklin's ships were fitted with that heating system that may have made life a bit more pleasant inside. Their exploration of the area would have been brutal because they weren't just floating through. They were like gathering data. Mm -hmm. This is from Royal Museum's Greenwich, quote, making magnetic and meteorological observations would have been a key part of the expedition's scientific remit. But the men had to do so carefully. Placing cold metal instruments up to the eye would cause the skin to be damaged or even removed. It was so cold. Oh, yeah. That like they would have to hold their breath to stop condensation forming on glass or metal parts of the tools they were using or they oh. would stick to their skin and rip their fucking skin off. That would suck. Yeah. Pulling sledges would be difficult too. If the men were exploring beyond the ship, even when temperatures outside are negative 50 Celsius, you still sweat heavily. And when you stop, the sweat can turn to ice in your underwear. Ugh. So they would have to do these like short missions. Cause if they start sweating, you're kind of fucked. Freeze their balls. Yeah, you'll, yeah, your clothes will freeze to your skin, and then you get really bad frostbite. Oh, man. The expedition, with 129 men, was the best-equipped British Arctic venture of its time, but it mysteriously disappeared. Over the following years, search parties revealed only scattered clues pointing to starvation, cold, disease, and perhaps most crucially, lead poisoning as key factors contributing to the demise of the crew. The Erebus and Terror, which again, can we take a moment to honor how deeply horrifying the names <laughs> of these fucking ships are? Like, who did this? We know the Brits built these bad boys, but I could not find a specific person to blame for these creepy fucking names. Uh, do you know what Erebus means? No. I, I just too scared Googled to look. it. Erebus in Greek Greek religion is the god of a dark region of the underworld and the personification of darkness. Bitch, what? <laughs> he is the son of chaos. Who would get on those boats? <laughs> I don't know. I think the writing was on the wall. <laughs> that is self-fulfilled prophecy. <laughs> I, wow, okay. That seems like really bad juju Whoa. to name your two boats those the names. The Brits are dark. Yeah. Anyway, the ships departed from Gr Grinneth, Kent, on the morning of May 19th, 1845, with a crew of 24 officers and 110 men under Franklin's command. And you know what that means. I'm so glad. It's time for some geography. And I tried to focus on creepier names. Like Erebus? Yeah, like Erebus. So Grinneth a town on the River Thames, which makes sense. They, they would launch the ships into the river and then out into the ocean. Is east of Goring. <laughs> west of All Hallows. I like that, though. I like that one, too. And then I had to just be cheeky with these other ones. South of Butterwick <laughs> and north of Coxheath. Ick. <laughs> Your delivery is the grossest part it's about so it. It's so gross. <laughs> The ships stopped briefly to load up on fresh water in Stromness, Orkney Islands in northern Scotland. 
From there, they sailed to Greenland, accompanied by uh, a ship called the HMS Rattlerund, which was a transport ship. So it was like, we're going to get you to these spots to load up on supplies and then bye, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. The passage to Greenland took 30 days. Both vessels were specifically modified for Arctic service, equipped with steam engines, reinforced hulls and ample supplies. They carried provisions for three years, including canned food, which was a relatively new preservation method. The goal was to chart passage through the labyrinthine Arctic archipelago where no ship had ever completed a westward journey. Oh so God. they climbed into the the hell and the terror to go where <laughs> literally no man had ever fucking gone before. So I know you texted me earlier today mm -hmm. saying like, did you know that Netflix show The Terror is about this? Or it's I had AMC? no idea. Yeah, I watched that a few weeks ago. And it's not like a historical retelling, but it's like what might have gone down it, with. There's definitely a paranormal element in the yeah. show. It's like a, um, it's a thriller. But but the but the details and the story about the men, the story about the canned food, about the ship, everything uh -huh. like it paints such a vivid picture, and it's like you terrifying. Really don't, you don't know where it's going. I loved no. it. It's really fucking good. Well, and I love the idea that, like, yeah, there's a paranormal theme that runs through it, but it also could be a commentary on their psychological states. Totally. As the, they were. The paranoia and the. Mm -hmm. I think it's. What they might have been experiencing because of the lead poisoning. Yeah. You could read it as really allegorical. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So they left in May. And by July of 1845, the ships had been seen by whalers in Baffin Bay, where they were waiting for better conditions before continuing on to enter into the unknown ice field. So it had taken them all those months to even get into position to, like, go into the, the Northern Passage. That was the last time Europeans saw the expedition alive. For two years, there was no word from the explorers, and concern grew in Britain. And now I have to say, concern grew more rapidly because Franklin's wife, who had obviously stayed behind in Europe, was like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. You guys need to put some resources out toward finding my husband and all of these men that are mm -hmm. on these ships. You can't, it's been two fucking years. What are you doing? Yeah. So in 1948, they left in May of eight, or sorry, 1840 or 1848. They'd left in May of 1845. Search expeditions were finally sent to locate them, marking the beginning of an extensive search that would last for over a decade. Ooh. Two expeditions by sea were launched, one led by James Clark Ross entering the Canadian Arctic archipelago through Lancaster Sound, and the other commanded by Henry Kellett entering from the Pacific. In addition, the Admiralty offered a reward of 20,000 pounds for basically information, which would be the equivalent to over 2 million 500,000 pounds as of 2023. Wow. Quote, to any party or parties of any country who shall render assistance to the crews of the discovery ships under the command of Sir John Franklin. When the search effort failed, British national concern and interest in the Arctic increased until, quote, finding Franklin became nothing less than a crusade. They were looking and looking. They were obsessed with finding him. They couldn't find shit. Mm, not a ship or anything. Nope. Ballads such as Lady Franklin's Lament, commemorating Lady Franklin's search for her lost husband, became popular. Oh, I have a sad. link to uh, a YouTube video of it. It's been like used in a bunch of songs. I was going to play it, but f for time, I'm going to let you guys go find it on yourselves. But I will have it in our sources. But it's, uh, it's a haunting song Ooh. about this lost crew and these lost ships. Only limited information is available about subsequent events from like the last time they were seen. And more and more information has been pieced together over the next 150 years <laughs> by other expeditions, explorers, scientists, and interviews with Inuit peoples in the region. So they were last seen by Europeans right before they went into the passage, basically, but there were still Inuit communities that like lived in and around those more isolated areas. They were probably really aware of them if they were anywhere near. Yes. And there is pl ample evidence 
to suggest that they had interaction with each other, at least while possibly while they were stranded, but at least before that. Search expeditions found scattered relics and clues in the 1850s. In 1850, the graves of three crewmen from these ships were discovered on Beachy Island, where the ships had wintered from 1845 to 1846. The gravestones suggested that the three men had died early in the journey. In 1854, John Ray, an explorer, spoke with Inuit peoples who told him about starving white men who had resorted to cannibalism. Uh Uh-oh. Ray found physical evidence supporting these claims, recovered artifacts from the expedition, including tools and clothing. However, the fate of the majority of the crew remained unclear. So they're just getting these little stories and like little bits of evidence. But like, where the fuck are these ships? Yeah. Looking for them was highly dangerous. One ship, the HMS investigator, had gone searching for the Franklin expedition in 1850 and had been abandoned in 1853 after getting stuck in the ice. The rescue crew did survive, but never even made it close to where the ships were expected to have been trapped. There's also, if you look on the drive, there was like a traveling expedition about this that includes photographs of the three exhumed graves that were found. And what? how Whoa. we'll talk about the preservation of these <gasps> bodies. But this is like, I love this. Isn't it nuts? Wow. Yeah. I knew. Oh, you, I knew you. They go. are not. Decomposed. decomposed at all no they just look frostbitten oh it's, it's my. wild they look like they're carved out of wood yeah they're so well preserved oh my god i'm obsessed with this in 1859 a search party led by captain francis leopold mcclintock made a major breakthrough when they found a note on king william island the note called the victory point note a two-part letter found on king william island remains the only first-hand accounting of what what was going down According to the note, Franklin's men spent the winter of 1845 to 1846 on Beachy Island, which we knew because the three crew members who had died were buried there. After traveling down Peel Sound through the summer of 1846, hoping that there was like some melt and they could make their way back into the passage, Terror and Erebus became trapped in ice off King William Island in September of 1846 and are thought never to have sailed again. Mm. According to the second part of the Victory Point note, dated April 25th, 1848, and signed by crew members Fitzjames and Crozier, the crew had wintered off King William Island in 1846 to 1847, and then again in 1847 and 1848, and Franklin had died on June 11th, 1847. So their leader died. The remaining crew had abandoned the ships and planned to walk over the island and across the sea ice toward the back river on the Canadian mainland beginning on April 26, 1848. In addition to Franklin, eight other officers and 15 men had also died by this point before the remaining people were like, well, we got to walk because there's nowhere else we can go. So I don't know if you know this, but or if this is accurate or if you have this information, but in the show... It was like at least 500 miles. They were going to have to walk through and like easily pull their sleds and stuff. Easily. Ugh. Yeah. The Victory Point note is the last known communication of the expedition. Of the crew who decided to walk the ice to the mainland, none survived the march. Skeletal remains, artifacts, and more evidence of cannibalism were found in later years, providing a harrowing picture of the men's desperate final days. It appears some of the men had certainly resorted to cannibalism as many bodies were mutilated and body parts were found frozen in cooking pots. Oh my God. Yeah. At the ship or on their walk? On their, this is like stuff that's been recovered like years later on the walk. They still hadn't, we didn't find these ships until like the last 10 years. This is just shit. They're they're searching in this giant area on the ice of like where they think they could have gotten trapped and gone down and oh finding God. this shit. So did, when they decided to walk, did all of them walk or did some of them stay behind? I'm not sure the answer to that, but a lot of people decided to walk. But a lot okay. of people had also died before they even got to this point. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly not all like 124 were walking, but there were groups of probably like 30 to 50 people. Mm -hmm. that did try to walk to safety. The role of lead poisoning in Franklin's expedition first came to light in the late 20th century when scientists began re-examining the remains of the crew that had been found on Beachy Island. So they they exhumed the guys that we had the pictures of. Those three, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did a bunch of tests. 
Autopsies of the well-preserved bodies, especially that of John Torrington, showed high concentrations of lead in their bones and soft tissues. Further analysis confirmed that the sailors had suffered from severe lead poisoning, likely originating from the tinned food or the ship's water system, slash both. Oh, God. Which used lead piping and solder. Soldier. Uh, Soldier. So here's an excerpt from an academic journal written by Dr. Richard Bayliss detailing the discovery of the remains of the crew. And yes. Lucy, I pulled this case, the, this <laughs> specifically because you're going to fucking love it. Yes, I love Quote, you. I know, I got you back. <laughs> Expeditions in 1981 through 1986, so like a long fucking time after, they still hadn't found these ships yet, but it's still being studied and they're still sending crews with updated technology to try and find all of this oh, shit. that's insane. By Dr. Owen Beatty, an anthropologist at Alberta University, have helped explain what may have happened. In 1981, the investigators found many skeletal remains, some of Inuit peoples and others from the crew of the British ships. Macroscopic examination of the bones of expedition members showed evidence of scurvy and their lead content was 228 parts per billion compared with what would be considered more normal of the time, which was about 22 to 36 parts per million. And that <sighs> was... That was determined by bones of indigenous Inuit remains that were also found in that area. So it had so, nothing to do with like the environment, you know, the environment or like, oh, we have a lot of fish. Nope. The indigenous population Damn. was not drinking water out of lead pipes or eating canned food that was soldered with lead. Oh, man. In 1984, Beatty and his team returned with the express purpose of exhuming the graves of the three members of the crew buried early in 1846. The first to be exhumed was a stoker on HMS Terror, John Torrington, age 20, who had died on January 1st, 1846. The ground on top of the grave was cement hard permafrost that had to be pickaxed to remove it. Oof. A meter down, they found the coffin. Removal of the lid was difficult because it was held down with square nails and stuck to the coffin by ice. The corpse was in, within was frozen in a block of ice. Oh, my God. By pouring water over it, the body was thawed out and proved to be well-preserved after 138 years. Jesus. It was emaciated and weighed less than 40 kilograms, which is about 88 pounds, with a body mass index of 15, where a normal body mass index for that time and the, that age was about 20 to 25. So they were like half their BMI of a normal healthy person of that time. Ooh, yeah, he Showing doesn't look that, great. No. I mean, I know he's dead and mummified, but like, he's, he's real wasted thin. away, yeah. He's wasted away. He's, man, the preservation yeah. is astounding. It's wild. Yeah. Showing that Torrington must have lost a lot of weight since leaving England, since going on this expedition. His hands showed no evidence that he had been a stoker, even though we know that that was his position there. And this suggested that he had been too ill to work long before he died. Ooh. The lungs showed pleural adhesions, anthracosis, emphysema, and evidence of tuberculosis. Death was attributed to pneumonia. Analysis of his bones showed lead levels of 110 to 151 parts per million. The lead level in the terminal part of his scalp hair was more than 600 parts per million. Oh, my God. But was slightly less in hair nearer to the scalp, suggesting that his lead intake diminished during the last weeks of his life when he was too sick to eat or drink anything. Ooh, that is gnarly. Yeah. 600. Yeah. That's like 30 times the amount. Uh-huh. In 1986, Beatty, this explorer, returned and exhumed the grave of John Harkness, a petty officer on HMS Erebus, who had died on January 4th, 1846, at the age of 25. His emaciated corpse was carried to the ne necropsy tent, and when his clothes were cut off, it was clear that a previous necropsy had been carried out, probably in 1846, on board the Erebus by their resident doctor, Dr. Goodsir, the assistant mm -hmm. surgeon. The corpse had a BMI of only 14. Harkness had died of pulmonary tuberculosis. Exhumation of the grave of the Royal Marine William Bain, age 32, who had died on April 3rd, 1846, followed after this last exhumation. The corpse was also emaciated, weighing less than 40 kilograms. 
There were many superficial tooth marks, which were thought to have been caused by rats that had tried to eat the body while it was still on board the ship. Uh, oh, rats got to eat, too. But still. Oh. The lungs showed evidence of tuberculosis, but no organisms were cultured. Lead levels in samples of Bain's hair were 145 to 280 ppm, and x-rays showed collapse of the 11th thoracic vertebrae due to tuberculosis. So that's a condition called Pott's disease, I guess. So, like, they died from these illnesses, but they're, like we talked about earlier, their lead levels were so high already Mm -hmm. that they were, like, making them sicker and making them more susceptible to these kinds of diseases that are kind of bound to pop up on ships. And it was obviously suspicious enough to the doctor to do a fucking autopsy. To do an autopsy. Yeah. Like, why are these people wasting away and getting so sick? Yeah. Whoa. What the fuck? (laughs) It seems that Franklin's last expedition was bedeviled by several different diseases. Tuberculosis was rampant in the 19th century, and the conditions on Erebus and Terror would have fostered its spread among the crew. With regard to scurvy, Dr. James Lind, a naval medical officer, had written his treatise on scurvy in 1754, and his 1757 paper on how to preserve the health of seamen had been adopted by the Royal Navy in 1795. So before they went on this exhibition... They were well aware of what scurvy was and had taken precautions to alleviate it on on these kinds of expeditions. They brought their oranges. Basically. So thereafter, scurvy was reputed to have been eliminated after we discovered that like citrus could, Mm -hmm. you know, alleviate it. So why would it have occurred in the personnel of Franklin's last Arctic exploration, despite each man allegedly receiving one ounce of lemon juice daily? (laughs) Here's some science for you. Asorbic acid is an unstable substance and prolonged storage with or without refrigeration may impair its function. It is possible that the lemon juice began to ferment and was boiled to prevent fermentation, a procedure that would have destroyed the asorbic acid, which is the key to yeah. fending off scurvy. Without Just, the acid, it's it's useless. Yeah. Oh, uh, so they, they wouldn't know that. Useless. They had no idea. None. Oh, boy. The chemical evidence of lead poisoning is almost certainly due to the soldering of the cans that contained the preserved meats as well as the lead in the in the water storage. Mm -hmm. The technology for preparing canned meat was brand new, having been patented in 1811, and the cans were sealed with a solder of tin and a high lead content. Contaminating the meat immediately adjacent, this solder was the probable cause of the high lead levels found in the bones and hair of the crew. This would have led to anorexia, fatigue, and weakness from peripheral neuritis, intestinal colic, and psychological manifestations such as anxiety and paranoia. (laughs) That is the last place on the planet you want to be paranoid. No. During a long, dark, Arctic winter stuck in a ship. Yep. And on top of that, because the canning process was of such low quality there was also likely botulism in a lot of the canned meat. So they were just getting so fucking sick and losing their minds at the same time. Oh, my God. The use of tinned food, a cutting-edge technology at the time, may have inadvertently sealed the fate of the crew. Although food preservation by canning was a relatively new process, it was not yet perfected. The cans used in Franklin's expedition were sealed with lead solder, and improper sealing or contamination may have allowed the lead to leach into the food, Lead contamination could have occurred in other areas, too. Like we said, the ship's water distillation system, which used lead piping, also likely contributed to the problem. Lead poisoning likely had disastrous effects on the crew's health. Symptoms of lead poisoning include cognitive impairment, fatigue, irritability, irritability, digestive issues, and motor dysfunction. Mm. So, like, the guy who couldn't do his job, like, he had no physical signs of being a stoker on the ship. Mm -hmm. he was too sick yeah these symptoms would have exacerbated the already immense challenges of arctic survival hampering the crew's ability to make sound decisions and weakening them physically the impact of lead poisoning likely contributed to the growing illness disorganization and eventual collapse of the expedition's leadership and morale can you even fucking imagine no You're trapped on an ice-locked ship on which you'd been slowly going mad from lead poisoning from your own provisions. Yeah, but you don't know it. 
You don't know it. And it, like, the, it might as well just be, you might as well think, think it's like a curse or like a demon or something. Of course. And then you get desperate enough to eat each other and wander into the frozen ice caps to survive. Like, absolutely the fuck not. Mm-mm. No. Mm-mm. No. My dad told me about this ship when I was like 10, Too young. maybe. He, he was reading a book about it. And he was explaining it to me and like, Ugh. and I should have covered this instead of the uh, Donner, the Donner party, because they're in my head. They're kind of similar, just mm-hmm. like bleak as fuck. So bleak. Yeah. And both relating to like heavy winters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So many still believe that lead poisoning w- was the primary factor in the expedition's failure, but other recent search- research has kind of complicated that picture as well. Because some studies argue that while lead levels were high, they may not have been acutely toxic and chronic malnutrition and disease, such as scurvy and tuberculosis, were likely more immediate causes of death. So like... Well, it didn't help. No, so I think what they're saying is that the lead didn't necessarily kill them. And what we don't have are records of what was going on on that ship as the expedition progressed because they were eating these provisions for months before they ever made it to the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So by the time they got there, they're being slowly poisoned. Their immune system is responding. They're susceptible to all of these other common ship-borne diseases and they're losing their mental faculties. So they like can't think they're paranoid. They can't figure out what's going on. They might be turning on each other. They can't make like leadership is falling apart. They can't make solid decisions that will aid them in their survival. So it's like, maybe this isn't exactly why they died, but it definitely fucked them up. It yeah. like it set them up to fail. Yeah. Skeletal remains show signs of scurvy, which would have weakened the men significantly. The extreme conditions of the Arctic also exacerbated their suffering, trapped in thick ice for multiple winters, running low on supplies, and ultimately attempting a desperate escape on foot. Inuit oral testimony collected by explorers like John Ray and later confirmed by archaeological evidence suggests that after abandoning the ships, the survivors may have made some progress but were eventually overcome by starvation and exposure. Despite the advanced preparations of the expedition, including that three-year supply of food, the harsh realities of Arctic exploration overwhelmed them. It's like you, they couldn't have been prepared for this mostly uninhabitable area that they were going into. They had no mm-hmm. fucking idea how bad it was going to get. Yeah. And like the indigenous people who live there, like they've been there for forever. M- millennia. Yeah. They're well, and very the- well, they know how to survive. And these dudes with their coats and their wool socks mm-hmm. from London. Well, and a lot of those interactions that they may have had would have been before they were so far into the ice that they couldn't be found. So the the indigenous population was likely not living, you know, necessarily on these like d- mm. truly mm-hmm. horrifying parts of the Arctic, but they are familiar with them. They would have hunting practices, fishing practices that would have familiarized them with the area. They were likely trading for some supplies earlier on in the expedition. And then as these guys got deeper, all contact was lost. And then they just found their remains later. God. It's, it's fucking wild. So the failure of Franklin's lost expedition was due to a combination of factors, including the harsh Arctic environment, scurvy, malnutrition, and perhaps most critically, lead poisoning, hindering their capacity to think clearly and survive. The high levels of lead found in the crew's remains likely debilitated them mentally and physically, leaving them less able to deal with the challenges they faced. The loss of the Erebus and Terror and their crews is a tragic reminder of the dangers of polar exploration, and Franklin's expedition remains a subject of enduring fascination and study. And we did not give up on finding these wrecks, and they were found not that fucking long ago. Oh, my God. So in recent years, the wrecks of both Erebus and Terror were discovered, providing more insights into the final days of the expedition. The Were they many... like under a bunch of ice? Yup. There's their shipwrecks. They're under the water. This this oh, part they're is under the water. Yeah, they went all they they were frozen in the ice for lost for God knows how long, and then one good summer when it can melt enough, 
it, it sunk. And they, 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 they were lost to the ocean. Though many questions still remain unanswered about what happened. Because again, even though they found these wrecks, like any written data that was on that ship mm -hmm. is lost to the water. So in 2014, the shipwreck of Erebus was discovered by Parks Canada in collaboration with Inuit communities. This and the following discovery of the terror in 2016. So it took even more years to find the terror. So they weren't even like next to each other or anything. Nope. Ugh. Marked two of the most important archaeological finds in recent history. What these archaeologists went through to find these ships was wild. So they had first found the HMS Investigator, which, if you remember, was mm -hmm. the ship that disappeared in the 1850s trying to find them. Well, they just abandoned it. They, yeah, they, they abandoned it, but the, the wreckage disappeared. Like, they knew about mm -hmm. whereabouts it was, but there are also currents under the ice. So it's like they knew because people had survived that where in general that shipwreck was so they finally found that in 2011 and they were like okay we're on the path so we're going to widen our search from here eventually they stumble upon the Erebus because they could use sonar to confirm that it was the ship they were looking for and they could like map it but they still couldn't access it because the ocean ice was way too thick and Parks Canada wanted to return to the Erebus site as soon as possible before the following summer when the ice would melt enough for divers. So they drilled a hole in the ice no. so the divers could go through the hole. No, they no, they shouldn't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. This is a waking nightmare. Diving under thick ice in utter darkness and sub-zero water temperatures. Are you fucking kidding me? No. And they did it. Utter, and they found it. Utter darkness. Horrifying. How how thick was the ice? Thick. I mean, there's a picture of them breaking it apart on the drive. Or I thought I included that. Oh, I didn't. God. But the it, mummy was still up. I yeah. zoomed way in on that. I thought I included it. <laughs> I didn't include it. But it, it was thick. Like several feet. No, I don't. It, mm -mm. This is a frozen ocean. Ugh. Throughout the season, archaeologists brought up artifacts from the upper deck and part of the lower, including guns, part of a wheel, fittings from the ship, dinner plates, clothing, and personal items. The search for the terror continued without success. It wasn't found until 2016, lying on the seabed under 48 meters of water in Terror Bay, Ugh. far from the planned search area. The discovery was made when the Arctic Research Foundation's ship made a detour to Terror, Terror Bay to follow up on a recollection made by one of the crew. So it was uh, like totally random. Like, oh, I heard that it might have been in this area. OK, we'll go check it out. And there it fucking was. Was it just a coincidence that the Terror sunk in Terror Bay? That is not clear. It's possible that Terror Bay is referred to because of it being the area where it yeah. disappeared. But... I I'm hope not there's sure. not another reason. Girl. <laughs> These names. I know. What so, is with 19th century explorers? You're so you're emo. So fucking emo. <laughs> so yeah, Franklin's Lost Expedition remains one of the most tragic stories of exploration, illustrating the extreme challenges faced in the Arctic conditions and the potential impact of human error and technological limitations and obviously fucking poison lead mm -hmm. poison the combination of environmental hardships inadequate supplies potential lead poisoning and the harsh realities of survival in the arctic contributed to the disappearance of franklin and his men today the expedition continues to be a subject of fascination and research shedding light on the complexities of polar exploration and the human spirit's resilience jesus christ isn't that wild yeah like part of me is like did Finding the terror in 2016, like, open some sort of fucking bullshit reality that allowed, like, Trump to get elected. Like, is that it the is terror's kind of when fault? everything started falling apart. Like, I feel like all of those TikToks I see where, where people will, like, discover a creepy box sealed in their wall and the people watching are like, put, put it, it back. back. <laughs> the sarcophagus. <laughs> put it back. Yeah. <laughs> It's under several feet of thick ice for a reason. We're not supposed to go there. We're the not sorceresses supposed put to put it there yep. to seal the hex. Yup. That would befell the world. Seal the terror. You fucked it up. And you unleash the terror on the world. Mm-hmm. 
Anyway, that's, I mean, obviously there's so much more to that story. There are like whole podcasts, TV shows, documentaries. There's a Watch the terror, the AMC, the terror. It is really good. But I hope I gave you like a little tantalizing piece of cheese to lead you down the rabbit hole that is the Franklin Expedition because Mm -hmm. holy fucking shit. Scary shit. Sweet little chip of lead paint. Yep. So thank you, Andrea, for terrifying us with this topic selection. Yeah, Andrea, I hope we did you proud. And check out Andrea's podcast, United States of Lead. Yes, please do. There seems to be no limit of shit to discuss about lead. It is insane. It's wild. Yeah, definitely check it out. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Danielle Sylvan. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Our production manager is Andrea Gardner. For photos and sources, check out our blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can follow us on all the socials at Wine and Crime Pod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support, Support and get access to all sorts of wine fueled bonus content, visit our Patreon page. Cheers! This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Fiscally responsible financial geniuses, monetary magicians. These are the things people say about drivers who switch their car insurance to Progressive and save hundreds. Visit Progressive.com to see if you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states or situations. Okay, it's official. We are very much in the final sprint to election day. And face it, between debates, polling releases, even court appearances, it can feel exhausting, even impossible to keep up with. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm the host of Start Here, the daily podcast from ABC News. And every morning, my team and I get you caught up on the day's news in a quick, straightforward way that's easy to understand with just enough context so you can listen, get it, and go on with your day. So kickstart your morning. Start smart with Start Here and ABC News because staying informed shouldn't feel overwhelming.